Hey everyone, I want to ask you a question. Have you ever had a near-death experience? Now, I've asked this to many people over the years, and almost universally, they answer with an affirmative. As Americans, we tend to live relatively safe lives. We don't experience a lot of the conflict, suffering, um, governments, wars that go on, famines that go on throughout the world. Um, but it always amazes me that we are but one heartbeat away at any given moment from stepping into eternity. Now, I know we don't like to think about that often, and it's usually only at funerals or some significant event where we think about the possibility of death. But sometimes when I lay my head down on the pillow at night and you kind of in this in the sense of in the place of solitude and silence, you, you can even hear or you can feel your heart beating. And I'm not the one that's sustaining it. <laughs> and that's a very humbling thought. We are not in control. We're not in control. Oftentimes when I meet people, I, I ask them, I love to ask this question, did you grow up with any kind of spiritual background? And maybe more specifically, what, what do you think is on the other side after you die? Do you believe in heaven? Do you believe in hell? Uh, what do you think is on the other side of the fence, so to speak? And more personal if you were to die, where do you think you would go? Now, a lot of times when I ask this question, people have this general sense of life continuing on after death, um, of eternity, and of this belief in a general place of good and a general place of punishment, heaven and hell. Um, and most times when I talk to people and ask them that question, if you were to die today, where would you go? Well, I'm a pretty good person. I think I'd go to heaven. And my follow-up is, well, how confident are you? And what evidence do you have that supports your belief? Evidence and confidence. Now, the Bible is really clear on this point. The Bible states that there is, in fact, a creator. He is infinite in power. He's outside of time. He holds the entire universe in his hands. The sun is 969,000 times larger than the Earth, and it's one of the smallest stars of trillions in our galaxy, and there's trillions of galaxies, and God's outside of them all. He holds the entire universe in his hands. He reads the thoughts of 8 billion people all at the same time. He knows your past as well as your future, every decision you've ever made, your greatest joys, your greatest pains. Uh, he's all-powerful. And the Bible states that God, in making humans, in making mankind, has placed in the heart of each person this concept, this belief, this idea in eternity. And you look at different cultures, you look at different races, different colors, different places, time, in, in history, and you, you find this general belief in the afterlife. Um, the problem is that surveying different cultures over time, you will come to a plethora of variations, even though there's that same general foundational thought of eternity. So let me ask you a couple more questions. What if, what, what if, what if there was absolute truth? And here's another one. Now this is a big if. What if there was a supreme being who created all physical matter, everything, everything that we see, everything that we experience, there is in fact um, a all-powerful creator. And what if there was life after death? And the most important thing that you could ever come to the conclusion about would be what what is to come. You know, even the longest lives here on earth, you might live a hundred years and 
possibly become a millionaire, but you leave it all behind and you go somewhere for eternity. And eternity is a lot longer than 100 years. So when I grappled with this concept, this thought, it really compelled me to pursue the truth about what is to come. The final question, when I'm talking with people at the gym, restaurant, wherever, and I love to hear where people stand and what they believe and why they believe it. But the final question, the key question, oftentimes that I ask is, if you could know the truth, would you want to know it? And most people say, yes, I, I would want to know the truth. I don't want to just risk my life. It's precious. Uh, I don't want to just roll the dice. I, I want to be confident. I want that confidence. I, I would want to know the truth. So today I am sharing the most important message that I as a pastor have to share or that I as a believer, as a Christian, have to share. It's, it's the message, it's the truth that changed my life. And it's the very core essence. If you were to summarize what the Bible teaches, this would be the foundation. This would be the essence. It's called the gospel. It means good news. And we're going to look at a presentation today here in a moment where I'm going to share some of those truths in a visual form um, that I think that will be very helpful to you. Now, I have shared this on dozens of occasions. I've used napkins. I, I've drawn it in the dirt. And every single time, people have really thanked me for presenting truth, biblical truth, in a way that they can truly understand and grasp. Now, I'm not the originator of this presentation. It's called The Three Circles. Uh, but I had a pro professor at Liberty called Jimmy Scroggins, who is the pastor of Family Church down in Florida. And he's got some great YouTube videos that do training on this called The Three Circles Gospel training. You can look that up. I'm sure you'll find it. Jimmy Scroggins. So he's the one that gets all the credit. But I want to read two quick verses before we get started. This first one is in 2 Corinthians 4.4. 4, and it says, the God of this age, now it's not talking about Jesus, it's talking about Satan or the devil. The God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ. In other words, what Paul was saying here is, here is, we are actually in a spiritual war. Now, I think people have a general understanding that there's good and evil in the world and that the good is battling evil, evil is battling good. Uh, but we're not as keen on the invisible spiritual war that's taking place right now for the eternal souls of mankind. And the reality is you and I are eternal beings. Like we are incredibly, infinitely precious to God, our creator. And Satan knows this. And I'm going to talk about this a little bit more in the presentation. Satan knows this and he is out to do everything he possibly can to thwart God's plan and God's purpose for your life because he wants to get back at God. He, he's in this business of fighting against God and God's kingdom, God's glory. And he's going to do everything he possibly can to deceive mankind, to deceive humans, so that they uh, destroy themselves, so that they believe in lies, and um, they enter eternity unprepared and go to a place of judgment. So I don't know what your spiritual background is, but I want to encourage you to, to really be open to this presentation. and. Um, to really give this some, some thought. So here's the second and, and final verse before we get started. It's called Romans chapter 1, verse 16. And it says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. Now, there are a couple words and phrases in this one verse that really stand out to me that in reading it, I would want to be defined. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Well, what, what, is, what is the gospel? Because it is the power of God that brings salvation. Well, how does God's power operate through the gospel? Uh, what Describe to me salvation. And it says, to everyone who believes. Is that the method? What does it mean to believe? So there's a couple questions that come up that I'm sure will be answered in this presentation of the gospel, of the good news the free gift that God is offering to each one of his precious creation. So I'm going to do my best 
to uh, I went through like 20 different markers on this and it was very frustrating uh, I try one out toss it try one out toss it I think I picked the best ones I can in multiple colors so bear with me we're going old school here I've literally screwed in a piece of paper to my loft in my office uh, I'm not much of a technology guy so I'm sure you'll forgive me for this now let me just draw this out three circles this first circle is called the circle of brokenness I think there's only one N. I don't know why I drew two. Okay, I'm a terrible speller. Now, brokenness, everywhere we look in the world right now, um, there is pain, there's suffering, there's death. Uh, you, you, you look at relationships, you look at lives, you look at, at, at systems, we see conflict, we see violence. Um, it's like the world is not, it's not as it's supposed to be. And we can't quite put our finger on what what is wrong. There's poverty. And if you look closely at mankind over the years, over the centuries, we have tried so many different solutions to this problem. Um, some people turn to politics. I could write that up. Some people are turning to money. Uh, maybe addiction. Some people turning to pleasure. Uh, could put good works up here. Uh, let's see. Unfortunately, everywhere, every every means by which we try to solve this problem of brokenness in our lives. It comes up empty. It's been described as like a rubber band that as you stretch it out in your attempt, it just snaps right back. Nothing fixes the foundational problem. And there's more. I mean, people turn to suicide to fix this place of brokenness. Um, but whatever you turn to, whatever you are trusting in, whatever you think will fix it never does. And the world hasn't changed. It doesn't matter what government, it doesn't matter how progressive we get with technology. This essence of brokenness still exists. Now, the Bible says that God never created the world in this state. So I'm labeling this second circle called God's perfect design. Genesis chapter 1, verse 31 says that in the beginning, everything that God made, he said, was good. So something happened between God's original creation and the world that we know today. And this is really an important point of, of discussion. I'm going to draw a bridge here in red. And I'll put Romans 3.23. Let me share this for a moment. Satan and... We will. So in the beginning, when God made the world, the highest of all his creation was humans made in God's image. And rather than make us like robots, God gave mankind the ability, like free will, the ability to make a choice. And the very essence of that nature is to decide between good and evil. So with free will, we could willingly choose to obey or we could willingly choose to disobey, to rebel. Uh, we could willingly choose to love, or we could willingly choose to pursue selfish interests. 
The Bible also talks about a being, perhaps some scholars believe the highest created being in the universe outside of now God's uncreated. This would be the highest created being. The Bible gives him different names. Lucifer was probably his original name. He ministered in the presence of God to reflect the light um, and glory of God. And we would call him Satan or the devil or Lucifer. And the Bible doesn't explain exactly how this happened, but somehow Lucifer got pride in his heart. And he desired to usurp power from God, the throne of God, for himself. He convinced a third of all the angels in heaven to side with him. And he pursued a rebellion to take away the throne and become king of the universe himself. Now, of course, it was a no contest. God's uncreated. Satan is a created being. God is infinite in power. Satan is finite in power. And for some reason that we don't fully understand at this exact moment, it's not fully described in the Bible, God, when Satan lost the battle, he and his fallen angels, which we would call demons today, were cast down to earth and have created havoc and deception and destruction ever since. So Satan has worked with this concept of free will in humanity to bring about a very key concept. And that is Romans 3.23, or I could just put this three-letter word, sin. So let me read Romans, grab my Bible here, Romans 3.23. It says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But if you look at this chapter, a few verses before, it says, No one is righteous, not even one. No one who understands. There's none who seek after God. All have turned away. There's no one that does good. Everyone practices deceit. They're swift to shed blood. The way of peace they do not know. They have no fear of God before their eyes. And it says, No one will be declared righteous by works of the law. No one's going to be declared righteous by any attempt that they can to fix the situation or to fix themselves. Um, when man, when Adam and Eve originally rebelled against God, when God, who knows what's best, laid out the perfect plan, Adam and Eve, and just about every single one of us, I shouldn't say just about every single one of us, has willingly left God's perfect design, we've chosen to go to this place of, of brokenness because of sin. Sin is what causes this place of separation between God and his creation, between God's perfect design, where we see, we see, we still see elements of this, his beauty, his purpose, his favor, but it's not nearly what it ought to be or what it once was. Now, here's the, here's the scary thing. The Bible is very clear on this. Everyone who dies in a place of brokenness, separated from God, remains separated from God for eternity. In a place called hell. So, because God's an infinite being, He will, He must. He must either bless infinitely righteousness, holiness, goodness, or he must curse, he must judge infinitely sin, rebellion, and uh, selfishness. And so anyone who dies in a place of separation from God, Jesus speaks about this quite frequently, will end up in a place of hell, of eternal torment, torment and separation. Now, the Bible says that God never created hell for men. It was created for Satan and his fallen angels, his demons. But Satan, knowing that he cannot get back at God directly, his goal is to attack the thing that's most precious to God. Like if you wanted to get to me, you wouldn't try to hurt me directly. You, you'd try to hurt my family. And that's the same thing that Satan's doing. He's not trying to hurt God directly because he knows he can't do anything against God one-on-one. -on -one. What he's doing, and the verse that I read second uh, Corinthians 4 4 
Satan's out to deceive as many people as possible to get them to trust in all of these things that will never solve this place of, of brokenness, never solve this issue of sin, so that he can bring, he can take as many human beings as possible to this place of eternal judgment, of hell. They die in their sin. He knows that God is just. God is good. He must punish all liars, all thieves, all adulterers. And it would be very important to point this out, that God's God is so perfect. He's so holy. I used to think, okay, well, to get into heaven, I'm a pretty good person. And if my good outweighs my bad, then it's like scales, you know, it would tip in my favor. So if you live a pretty good life, and you're good, far outweighs your bad, you, you should be good on the day of judgment. At least that's how most people think. That's how I used to think. The problem is this. What is God's standard? Is it 80%? Is it 90%? Is it 70%? And then where do you specifically fall? Could you be overinflating your own goodness? What if you think God's standard is 75% and you think you're 90% good? But then you die and you find out God's standard is 80% and you're actually at 78%. And you fall short and you don't make it into heaven. That would be terrible. You know, so has God left us an accurate, clear record description of of what it's going to take? Yes, he has. It was not explained to me for years and years. I went to church for years and no one ever shared this. Uh, um, I'm convinced for years I was on the path of hell to hell thinking that I was in right standing with God. So God is so perfect. Here's the standard. You have to be perfect to enter heaven. You have to be perfect. If you were to die today and God was to let you into his presence, he's infinitely holy, infinitely righteous, infinitely perfect. If he was to let you into heaven, which is a perfect place, it would no longer be perfect if God let imperfect people into that perfect place. Okay, It only makes logical sense. And God is so holy, he cannot allow evil, sin in his presence. So only the perfect person can enter eternity, can enter heaven uh, and expect that eternal favor. Which creates a predicament for all of us. Because the first time I heard this, I'm like, wow, we're all screwed then. What what hope do we have? That doesn't that doesn't sound very that doesn't sound very joyful. Like it doesn't sound very hopeful what what kind of god would make the situation where no one would be able to make it in in their own effort i'm going to get to that in a moment so here god is so holy he's so he's so righteous that when he when we're talking about the word sin god says the scripture says that he will judge every not every action but also every word and even every thought. So God doesn't just look at what we do. He's even reading the thoughts and motives of our heart. Can you imagine if for 24 hours a videotape was rolling of what you thought about uh, and that was placed on the screen for everyone else to see. I mean, it would be absolutely embarrassing. Jesus said, you've heard it said, do not commit adultery. But I say, if you've ever looked with lust at another person, you've committed adultery with God in your heart. You know, if you've ever had anger and hatred, you've committed murder in your heart. So God's not only going to judge actions and words, but he's going to judge our thought life as well. And any infraction, anything less than absolute 100% perfection in this place of brokenness is going to lead us to a place of judgment where God, as the just judge of the universe, must punish. Because he is loving, he must punish all sin. Like, think about every single person who's ever harmed you or hurt you. Don't you want justice? Some of them have never been brought to justice. One day, God's going to straighten everything out. But here's the flip side. Think about everyone that you have harmed or hurt and justice on their end. 
against you. So all of us are in this predicament where no one measures up to the righteous, perfect standard of God's, of entering into God's perfect design, God's favor, and of heaven for eternity. Now, let me draw this third circle. And what I'll do here, I'll put Jesus in the middle. Okay. I am sure that you have heard the name Jesus before. Now, I had for many years, but I didn't understand the legal implications. I didn't understand exactly what Jesus accomplished and why. I heard he died on the cross. What does that mean for me? So God's in this place of heaven. He looks down. He sees there's no hope for humanity. But he loves. He's a God of both love and justice. His justice compels him to judge sin for eternity, infinitely. And yet his love compels him to show mercy, compassion. How does he reconcile the two of these? He must judge, and yet he, he desires to, to offer mercy. And he does that through Jesus Christ. So the best way for me to explain this... God leaves his heavenly realm, his heavenly abode. He enters into creation as a man, in human flesh. So he humbles himself from a place of, of divine perfection and enters into creation as a man, fully God, but yet in a human body. And he lives a perfect life without any sin at all. And so when Jesus died on the cross, willingly offering his life, willingly sacrificing his life, here's what he accomplished. God is willing. He's able. Now, this is not an automatic thing. We automatically deserve God's judgment and hell for eternity. But what God's offering through his own initiative through Jesus, is a means of exchange where Jesus, who was perfect in every way, is willing to substitute his life for yours. So God knew there's nothing you could ever do to earn your way, to restore the relationship and earn your way into heaven. So he thought, I'll do it on my own. I will go down. I'll live the perfect life that no human being could ever live. I'll do it. And when he died on the cross, he basically said, anyone who comes to me, I am willing to make an exchange in giving them my perfect righteousness and taking upon myself their sin. So Jesus is willing to take our sin upon his shoulders and pay for it in his own life's blood upon the cross is to take the judgment of God, the infinite wrath of God against sin, to take that himself and to offer those who come to him his own perfect holiness so that when God looks at me, for example, he, he, doesn't, he no longer sees my sin because that's been removed. It's been taken. It's been paid for. That eternal debt that I go, God, Jesus is willing to pay with his own life. Now, if Jesus had only been a man, then, then his life would have been able to substitute for the life of one other person. Like by the rules of the universe, if you lived a perfect life and you never sinned, you, you, would, you would earn heaven on your own effort. Or you could trade your life for some other person. I really love my mom. I lived the perfect life. 
God said, well, you can get into heaven or you can trade it with somebody else. You say, I, I would rather, I would, I would take hell. I'll take my mom's sin, take my perfect righteousness, put it upon my mom. So when you look at her, you don't see any sin. You're able to welcome her into heaven and I'll take her punishment for eternity. You could do that. So Jesus, both human, but also divine. One drop of his blood was of infinite value, which means he could make a substitutionary atonement. He could pay for the, for or pay the debt of an infinite amount of people because he is infinite in value. One drop of his blood of infinite value. The Bible only asks that we do two things. It's like two sides of the same coin. Now, it is God's grace that opens the eyes of the blind, it helps us to recognize that, that nothing we can do on our own initiative is ever going to solve this problem. And so he supplies the grace to be able to respond to Jesus in a way that will transform and change our lives. And in Mark chapter 1, verse 15, Jesus basically went around preaching, repent and believe. So let me describe those two words. Because that was in the original verse that I had read, believe. Repentance means uh, a, a turning from your path. As every action originates in the mind, repentance initiates as a, as a change of thinking. Like you realize you're not going in the right direction. You realize that all your efforts are futile. It's not going to fix your situation. So your mind begins to change, and that naturally leads to a change in action. So repentance is a forsaking. It's a renouncing of self. A, a good visual is you're, you're in the driver's seat of your car. You realize you're headed toward destruction, and you're willing to get out of the driver's seat and get into the passenger seat. That's repentance. That's letting go. That's giving up. That's submission. It's giving over your life to God. Now, belief is the flip side of the coin. It's entrusting yourself to him. So repentance is a giving up and belief is a giving over of your life. It's inviting Jesus to get behind the driver's seat and take the wheel. It's giving him the keys to your house. Up to this point, Sin, naturally, is defined as, as self being king of the universe. I'm king. I rule my life. I make my decisions. I'm not in submission to anyone. God considers that rebellion. So repentance is turning from my path, turning from me being Lord, king, sitting on the throne of my life. It's giving that up. It's forsaking that. And belief is entrusting myself is surrendering my life over to Jesus to let him be the new owner of the house, the new driver in the driver's seat, uh, the one that holds the key, the new king sitting on the throne in my life. Now, I'll share with you another example, illustration of this, because I understand this pretty well. When I entered the military, I had to be willing to surrender my life and to offer my life to someone else, which was essentially the, the federal government, Uncle Sam, you know, the United States military. So I, I looked at the costs associated with this decision and I didn't make this decision quickly. I, I considered the benefits, I considered the costs, and I knew that that by signing the contract, it was a life for a life. I, I was giving my life for four years to the United States military. And in exchange, they were promising certain benefits in, in, in return. And repentance is really that, that submission, that death of self. And belief is not just an intellectual agreement with a certain set of facts. Like Satan, he believes in Jesus, but that doesn't mean he's going to heaven. The key aspect that is lacking in Satan is his unwillingness to submit to Jesus as Lord. So the demons believe in Jesus. They even emotionally react. 
but there's no aspect of the will. There's no aspect of the heart that, that surrenders, that volitionally offers, submits to Jesus as, as Lord. So when someone comes to Christ and recognizes their desperate need for righteousness, for holiness, per, for perfection, and their inability to be able to fix this place of brokenness and sin on their own. When I got to that point, recognizing in the military, I mean, I could die. What if I took a bullet? My life is over in 10 seconds from now. I mean, what matters most? Does my bank account matter? Does, you know, my vacation, my upcoming vacation matter? None of that, all of that's thrown out the window. Uh, with this whole virus thing going on, you know, we're thinking about the reality of death a lot more. And the question really becomes, what matters most? What is on the other side for eternity? How can I be sure? And how can I live for what is infinite, what is eternal, rather than just what is here and now that is fleeting, that is temporary, and uh, that is like sand just coming through our fingertips? So when we come to Christ, I, I pictured as me taking off my red coat of sin and Jesus is saying, I'm willing to do an exchange. I will give you my white coat of perfect righteousness, and you take off your red coat, and we'll exchange lives. And so when God, if you are willing to do that, when God looks at you, he doesn't see your sin. He sees the perfect holiness of his own son, of Jesus. He doesn't see our sin anymore. Jesus has paid for that sin, past, present, and future, on the cross. He's absorbed the wrath of God for you and I who are willing to come to Christ and make that exchange with Christ. So as a result, the Bible says that we can be uh, restored we can be restored and rescued in our relationship with God. Now, this is an amazing thought. Quite apart from anything we could ever do on our own, God took the initiative. It's not automatic. We've got to respond. 17 years ago, I stepped out and got to the point and said, okay, I, I, I get it. I, I, I'm all in. Like, I, I am going, I'm offering my entire life. I did so to the military. I know what that feels like. They owned me. Uh, I had to surrender everything. They dictated what weapon I'd carry, when I was going to eat, when I was going to sleep, everything. And I, so I had that concept very clear, very fresh in my mind. And when I came to, to Christ, I mean, I thought about it for six months. And I recognized there was a cost associated with this. And Jesus even speaks about that in, in Luke chapter 13. And so when I came to Christ, <clears throat> I gave him everything. Now, here's the amazing thing that took place. The Bible says at that moment... We go from a place of spiritual death to spiritual life. In other words, you are spiritually dead right now in your sins. Eternally dead, spiritually speaking. You're under, you're under the wrath, the condemnation, the judgment of God. And the moment we transfer our sin to Christ, and the moment he transfers his holiness to us, we go from death to life. And you truly, the Bible describes this as being born again. If you've ever heard that ter terminology before. And when you're born again, you still have the same physical body. I st I'm still me. But something's changed. Something's significant. You become a new person. God gives you a new heart. Your eyes are open to a reality you've never seen before. And the amazing thing is, not only are we rescued from our sin, but we're restored in our relationship with God and his perfect design for our lives. A lot of people think about purpose. Like, why am I here? Like, what am I living for? What is this all about? You will never understand those things until through Christ, you are reunited in your relationship with the one who made you, who knows the answer to all of those questions. So not only do we have God's favor and we have a relationship, which is absolutely mind boggling. Can you imagine uh, I've asked this people. I've asked this question to many, many people. If 
What if you could have a relationship with the creator of the universe who knows all things, who's outside of time, who's all powerful. You could know this person in a personal, relational way. Not know about him, but know him personally. How would that change your life? It should change everything, right? And so through Christ, we can have that. We can enter into, be restored in our relationship with our creator. And with that comes this amazing concept. It's called adoption. In other words, God is kind of like our heavenly father. And he brings us into his family, into his household, into his kingdom. And we become a son or a daughter of the king of the universe. And with that comes incredible favor and the presence of God and the promises and blessings of, of God. I, now, if I study, I've studied every single religion. No other religion makes this claim. No other religion even comes close. They're diametrically opposed, every single one, to Christianity. Because every other religion says, well, you need to do these things. And if you do them enough, hopefully you'll be reincarnated. Um, if you give enough, if you, if you follow these rules, if you're religious enough, you can work your way up and gain favor with God and make it into heaven. Christianity is basically like, hey, God's perfect. He demands perfection. None of you measure up. You could never do it on your own. You're, you are condemned to hell for eternity. Oh, and but by the way, God loves you. And he stepped out to make a provision, a way for you to be saved. And so when we come through Christ back to God's perfect design, God makes a promise that's absolutely mind boggling. He says, when this exchange takes place, I personally will come and live inside of you. So the creator of the universe, by means of his spirit, will come and live inside of the genuine follower, the genuine believer of Jesus Christ. The one who genuinely gives his life over, empties himself, dies to himself. Then God says, I'm going to come and live inside of him. And when God comes to live inside of you, everything changes. Everything we don't have the power to overcome some of the sins, some of the things that we're engaged in, the evil. We don't have that kind of power, but God is all powerful. When he comes to live inside of you, even 1% more of God would spell the difference in a hundred different areas of your life. So really the key to the Christian walk after we've been saved is surrender, is emptying ourselves on a daily basis and saying, God, come fill me with your spirit, live through me with your spirit. And I want you to live your life, transform me to make me pleasing in your sight. Now, uh, because of Jesus, we can be justified, which means we're declared innocent in the courtroom of God's eternal uh, judgment you know, courtroom. We can be declared innocent. God no longer sees our sin. Jesus has taken our sin. We can be redeemed. That's another biblical word is redemption. And it kind of speaks of being purchased. When we're under slavery, our owner is Satan. You know, our destination is hell. Uh, we've got a chain around our neck, spiritually speaking. And we are being dragged off to a place of punishment for forever and ever. Jesus is willing to purchase us from slavery to redeem us. You know, redemption from this place of slavery and judgment to bring us to a place of favor. I've already mentioned the word atonement, but it's worth mentioning again. To atone means to cover. And it's kind of like we owe God every sin, every lie. Uh, think about, you know, stubbing your toe and saying GD or, you know, uh, using God's name as a curse word like blasphemy. Every time we've done that. I mean, it's a great it's a third commandment. Grave sin. Fifth commandment. Honor your father and mother. Have you ever talked back to your mom and dad? Have you ever disobeyed them? We've broken that hundreds, thousands of times. So no one, no one is perfect. Everyone falls short and God is willing. Picture this huge hole of debt. Every time we sin, we dig the hole a little bit deeper. God is willing through Jesus to fill that hole in completely. That's atonement. He covers our sin with his own perfect, infinite righteousness. So let me, uh, let me close by saying this. I, in, I know this is a little bit longer. It's more thorough. 
in presenting this concept to people, I always ask them, where do you think you are on this map? And most people would say, um, you know, I'm in the place of brokenness. I might be kind of in between or I am in God's place of design because I, I have been transformed. I've been changed. I've been born again through Jesus Christ. So where are you at? The, qu the next question would be, where do you want to be? Where would you like to be? And a lot of times people say, oh, man, I I'm, I'm, want to be here. I, brokenness, suffering, pain, disease, death, poverty, relationships, uh, <laughs> systems, politics. I mean, I, I, I want to be here. I want to know that I know. I want to know God in a personal way. I want to know why I'm here. Where am I, where am I going? I want to be restored. And here's the third question. What is it that is preventing you from making a decision? What is preventing you from repenting and entrusting your life completely to Jesus, surrendering your life to Jesus right now? And that's where people generally quiet down and get stuck. And I have shared that question. And you might hear a response like, well, I'm just not ready. Well, what is it? What, why not? Well, <laughs> because uh, I'm doing certain things and I don't want to give them up. And in essence, here's what they're saying. I love my temporary pleasure so much that I am willing to enjoy 20, 30, 40, 50 years of temporary pleasure here on this earth. And sacrifice eternity in hell forever for the sake of minimal years of temporary pleasure. And so oftentimes people don't want to give up control. They don't want to give up control. They don't want to give up their, their pleasure. They, they don't want to sign things like, again, military. You, you, you can't be in You cannot run your life and enter the military. They send you to basic training immediately. They own you. They dictate your entire existence from that point forward. Now, you gain some freedom later on. But when you come to Christ, it's an all or nothing thing. I mean, we're not talking about you having to do anything beforehand. All I did was sign the contract to the military. I found out what that contract entailed for the four years to come. With Jesus... I, I'm in a place of desperation. I'm in a place where one heartbeat away, I'm going to hell. One bullet and I'm entering eternity. I mean, what matters? And I, I got to this place. I said, uh, I'm not in control. I, I've got to, I've got to do so. I mean, I, I never, I don't know. I don't know what is to come. And Jesus in this place of desperation, I'm willing to do whatever you tell me. And he's like, okay, sign this piece of paper. And it's blank. And I said, well, what am I signing? And he's like, you're signing your life. And in exchange, I'll give you my life. And I just signed this blank piece of paper. And ever since I've been owned by Jesus, like he owns me. I, I, I'm, I work for him. He's my master. He's my king. He's my Lord. And it's amazing because Jesus, he doesn't ask of you something that he's not willing to do himself. He's a good leader. He gave his life back to me. Like he gave his life for me to purchase me from this place of, of eternal destruction. But also he gives his life every day for me now. Like that exchange, the preciousness of living in a personal relationship with Jesus far surpasses any other pleasure on this earth. So where are you at? Where would you like to be? And what's preventing you? It's not worth it. Whatever your answer is to this question is not worth it. And I'm fearful for people when I hear them and it breaks my heart. And I'm sure it breaks God's heart because he's like, he sees their eternal state. He, do you understand that at any given moment, God is holding us in his hands. And if he just turns his hand 90 degrees, we plunge into eternity. I mean, who, who of you, you don't have any control whether you get the virus or not. And if you get the virus, how are you going to respond? How your body's going to respond? 
You think you're in charge of the trillions of chemical reactions, cellular reactions that take place on a second by second basis in your body of how your body responds? That's completely in God's hands. Like we've got a, if, it's a fearful thing to think about, but there is no greater wisdom than coming to a knowledge of the truth and submitting your life to that truth. And so I really want to encourage you. I want to appeal to you to respond today. Don't put it off another day. I have had conversations with people who are no longer walking this earth. And I'm not, I'm not convinced. I never was a part of their decision to make this exchange and to handle their sin issue. I can't imagine a worse fate than entering eternity to a place of eternal destruction in the presence of Satan, his demons, torment, fire, you know, that is forever and ever. So, my appeal is that you would seriously consider the truths presented and that you would respond today, now, by saying something as simple as, I mean, God can read your heart. It's not a magical prayer. There's nothing you need to do. I just got to this point where I'm like, okay, God, I'm all yours. Like I'm turning from my path. I recognized how I've been living is sinful. I recognize that it's wrong. I'm giving it up. I'm giving it over to you. And I, I'm trusting you with my life. Like I'm offering myself to you. And I didn't feel, me particularly, I didn't feel anything specific, supernatural in that moment. But in the course of the next couple months, I definitely experienced the radical presence of God working from within to change and transform me, to make me a different person. And you will as, as well. So I'm going to end it here, but I've got more videos and a teaching on salvation from Jesus' perspective. We're going to look at some verses of Scripture that uh, and, and study more in depth of Jesus' teaching, which would be a, a good follow-up to this presentation. So stay tuned, and we'll connect again. God bless you. I'm praying for you. Lord, I'm just praying for each person that watches this video that you would draw them closer to you as a result of the truths that are presented here and that lord if they're in a place of of decision god you would just supply grace to reveal yourself in a way that pushes them over the hump in a way that enables them to submit and surrender completely to you and that you would just flood them with joy flood them with forgiveness flood them with love remove all of that sin remove the consequences of that sin and just restore them to a place of your perfect design and favor. God, we can trust you for this. We thank you for your grace. And we thank you for reaching out to us when we had no hope in our own strength. Amen.